Hi, it's Dwyer, richarddwyer.com, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. I'm a civil lawyer, not a criminal lawyer. I'm a civil lawyer in Northern California. And from time to time, I review cases in the news just from a spectator perspective and uh, discuss the evidence here online. Now, I stumbled into <clears throat> the Amanda Knox case. Had no real dog in the hunt. Was just curious to find out more about the crime, about the uh, convicted uh, killers, and about the victim. Right? And uh, I have to tell you, the case to me is unremarkable. It's clear to me that Amanda Knox has some culpability in the murder of Meredith Kircher. Right? It's clear. Uh, quite frankly, this isn't a murder mystery, in my opinion. Right? The situation in Serial involving Adnan Saeed is much more interesting and has much more of a question of guilt than the situation here involving Amanda Knox. Now let me back up a step. Right now I have here online talked about my belief on how certain people, right, Mr. Dwani, in the Annie Dwani murder, right, Shirian Dwani, um, Oscar Pistorius, and others, uh, in my opinion, um, did the crimes that they're charged with, right? But understand, there's another side of the coin. I have also talked about here in a video my belief that Diane Downs shouldn't have been convicted, right? Adnan Saeed, my opinion is he shouldn't have been convicted on the evidence presented. So understand, I'm not someone here who is pro-prosecution, right? Quite the opposite is true. I'm looking for cases where people might actually have not done the crime. What I found, especially in my investigation of the Reuben Hurricane Carter case, was that often the person proclaiming their innocence isn't innocent, right? In my opinion, Reuben Hurricane Carter did the crime. Now, I've noticed that while the murder and while, in my opinion, her guilt is unremarkable, I believe Amanda Knox did what the prosecution asserts. What is remarkable about the Amanda Knox case is the organized group, and they're organized that seems to try to distort facts whenever anyone, not just me here posting videos on YouTube about the case, but I encourage people to go on Twitter and look at what's happening to the people on Twitter trying to discuss the evidence, right? Whenever someone does that, a group of people will step out of the shadows, right? They'll look friendly, right? Their posts will start in a friendly manner, then it'll quickly deteriorate from there. Evidence gets misrepresented. The identities of the individuals gets blurred. I've encountered no case where supporters of the convicted killer use as much effort to try to claim that the DNA evidence can't be trusted, right? That the statements of the convicted killer, right, Amanda Knox, can't be trusted because there was a language barrier, right, and that anyone in her position would start doing the things that she did, like accuse an innocent man of murder. It's a little bit astonishing. Then, of course, you get the strategy where the person starts saying, you don't know the case. The inference is that if you knew the evidence, then you would reach the conclusion that every intelligent person who knows the evidence would reach, which is that Amanda Knox couldn't have done the crime, right? Even more 
unbelievable is the fact that Amanda Knox has been on American television here. And of course, you would think that she is a head of state or something. People are hugging her and stuff like that. And keep in mind, this is someone who has been convicted of murder. Well, let me talk about one of the sharpest legal minds I know. This guy is a guy I always try to get an opinion from. I don't know the guy. I just try to look up his opinions here online whenever there's a legal matter. Right? That's in the news. And that's Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. Right? Now, let me just say, in my opinion, Dershowitz is one of the sharpest minds out there. In my opinion, Dershowitz knows more about the law than 99% of the people in the law, right? Well, let me just say there's a video here on YouTube of Alan Dershowitz giving his comments on the Amanda Knox case. It's entitled Alan Dershowitz, colon, lots of evidence against Amanda Knox. I would encourage everyone here to Google this video. In the video, Alan Dershowitz says that there are thousands of American people in jail today on the basis of far less evidence, right? Dershowitz further says that the evidence against Amanda Knox, in his opinion, is very, very considerable. Let me repeat that. Very, very considerable. Right? He points out that she has falsely accused someone else of committing the crime, that she created a false alibi, that she first admitted she was at the scene of the crime, that they found forensically that multiple people had to commit the crime, and that the first person convicted of the murder said she did it. Right Now, he further adds, and this has to be said in this case, that people who say there is no evidence are just not telling the truth. Now let me say this. As you can imagine, this video, which was done in February of 2014, resulted in other people, of course, coming forward with their explanations of why Dershowitz is wrong. I would encourage you to get both sides of the story Go ahead and look at those videos as well. But let me just say, Dershowitz's conclusion is that based on this evidence, she would be convicted and serving a life sentence, or perhaps even worse, would be serving the death penalty. Right, so understand, this isn't a case where there's no evidence. This isn't a case where people with law degrees who look at the evidence feel that the evidence is inconsiderable. Right? No, no. This is a case where the evidence is considerable. Now, what I'm going to do, rather than go through all of the evidence, because that would make this video way too long, is I'm just going to focus on the beginning of this case right? A time in the case before Amanda Knox is talking to the police at the police station and is coming up with tales that, in my opinion, are not credible, right? Such as when she accuses her boss of committing the murder. Right, let's talk about the very beginning of the case because it really, in my opinion, highlights the lack of credibility that Amanda Knox has. Right? Now, in the beginning of the case, understand how the case starts, how the police get involved. Right? Meredith Kircher's phone is found in someone's backyard. They turn it over to the postal police, right? The postal police then go to Meredith Kirchner's cottage to investigate why her mobile phone was found in someone else's yard. 
when they get to the cottage, they run into Amanda Knox and her boyfriend, Raphael. Now, incredibly, right, Amanda Knox and Raphael claim that they have called the emergency number for Italian police and that they were waiting for them to arrive. Right? Let me just, let me just say this. Gee, it's early in the morning, folks. I get a lot of calls. We'll let this call just go by. I'll call this client back a little later. Hold on a second. All right, back to the video. Understand that this claim by Amanda Knox and her boyfriend that they have called the emergency number for the Italian police is false. It's demonstratively false, right? There's no record of them making any call to the Italian police's emergency number. So we get a lie right out the gate, right? Now, you know the rest. Amanda and Raphael have some story of being concerned of some burglary having happened, right? You know, broken glass by their roommate, Filomeno Romanelli's room, right? And of course, they're concerned because there's some blood, right? So the postal police enter the residence, right? Now keep in mind, you would think that this is amazingly good fortune, right? Something's happened at the residence, right? Amanda Knox and her boyfriend supposedly want the police to show up. And, of course, um, the postal police happen to show up for something completely unrelated. Or so it seems, right? The uh, Kircher cell phone. So, of course, when they get in the residence, the door to Meredith Kircher's room is locked. Amanda Knox then tells the postal police, right? This is a statement directly from Amanda Knox, right? This isn't, you know from anyone else. She tells the postal police that there's no reason to be concerned about the locked door to Meredith's room because Meredith always locks her door. Well, of course, you know what happens, right? Filomino Romanelli, one of the two other roommates, shows up as soon as she shows up and she sees the locked door she immediately urges the police to break down the door why because meredith never locks her door according to filomino romanelli later we would find out from the fourth roommate laura mazzetti that in fact Meredith never locked her door. So the question is, why would Amanda Knox come up with this fiction that her roommate always locks the door and that the locked door shouldn't concern anyone? This, by the way, is with the place having allegedly been burglarized, right? We now know the burglary scene might have been staged, quite frankly, right? There's a mountain of evidence indicating that that burglary is staged. But this is with the place having allegedly been burglarized and with there being blood, right? Amanda Knox didn't want the cops knocking down the locked door. Well, let's go further. Understand Amanda Knox actually authored an email where she talks about what happened that day. 
tell me if you feel her story has changed. Now keep in mind, the fact that she mentions to the postal police that there's no reason to be concerned about the locked door is the kind of evidence where you understand there are people who witnessed it. Right, the postal police. Recall what Amanda told them. Right, we're dealing with a situation where you would have a heightened sense of awareness. Burglary. Bloodstains. Two people who have just told you that they call the emergency line for the Italian police. Right? Well, later, Amanda Knotts writes an email in which she discusses what happened that day. Let me just read a portion of it. I ran outside and down to our neighbor's door. The lights were out, but I banged on the door anyway. I wanted to ask them if they had heard anything the night before, but no one was home. I ran back into the house. In the living room, Raphael told me he wanted to see if he could break down Meredith's door. He tried and cracked the door, but we couldn't open it. It was then that we decided to call the cops. Now let's figure out this timeline. So we're supposed to believe that Amanda Knotts and Raphael were concerned about the locked door before the postal police showed up. We're supposed to believe that they were so concerned that they call the cops. And then when postal police show up, Amanda Knotts then tells them that there's nothing to worry about with the locked door because the roommate always locks her door. If her email is correct, I thought that Amanda and her boyfriend were so concerned about the locked door that they themselves tried to crack it open. So why would Amanda then tell the cops after they show up that there's nothing to worry about with regard to the locked door? Folks, that's the way the whole case is. Right? Amanda is acting in a very suspicious manner. Her supporters have to really stretch credibility to give us reasons why we should believe her. The objective evidence, right, whether she called the emergency line for the Italian police, doesn't back up her story. Why would Amanda tell the cops after they arrive at the scene that Meredith always locks her door when no other roommate at the residence supports that contention. Why would she say that lie? Right? Why would she then later come up with the email that she came up with? The case is replete with instances like this. Right? Let me just say, when you research the case, and you stumble upon instance after instance like this when you realize that there's a bloody footprint at the murder scene that couldn't be Rudy Cadets and that just happens to match Amanda Knox's boyfriends, Raphael's. When you realize that Amanda Knox falsely accuses some guy not even involved with doing the murder. And then when you realize that Raphael, her boyfriend, actually tries to explain away Meredith Kircher's DNA on the knife found at his place. Right? A knife that also has Amanda Knox's DNA. Right? And when you realize that Raphael's story, that he was once cooking with Meredith at his place, and that the knife may have accidentally poked her is demonstratively false because Meredith Kircher was never at Raphael's place. When you realize that both of these young people are lying about different parts of the case, 
right? Even Amanda Knox's supporters have to admit that she signed a statement that was false, right? To implicate an innocent man in this murder. Once you piece it together, folks, the case isn't that challenging, right? Once you piece it together, quite frankly, there are many cases that have more doubt about the guilt or innocence of the individual involved in this case. Did you know that people saw Amanda Knox hours before this crime took place and that she didn't have a scratch on her then after this crime took place she had a scratch on her? Did you know that? In other words Really, as Alan Dershowitz has pointed out, there's considerable evidence here, right? Don't be misled by the army of people out there who have websites, by the way, that are hopelessly one-sided and trying to exonerate Amanda Knox. Don't be fooled by the reception Amanda Knox has gotten from the American media where people like Robin Roberts actually hug her on camera. Folks, what you have here is a woman who out the gate is claiming to have made calls to police that she didn't make and then is making statements to the police that contradict her own later statements. Right? You have her blood at the murder scene, let me point out, you can share a room with someone and not have your blood mixed with a roommate's blood in the places in this apartment where the two were found together. Let me point out too that there is no question that the body is moved. Let me point out, some people here online have talked about the blood evidence, right? There is a substance called luminol that you can spray and actually see the blood. There's no question that this murder scene, right, involved a body that was moved after it was murdered, right, and blood stains in places that indicate that the people whose Blood is part of the stain, right? There are five different blood stains, right? We're involved in moving around the body after death. There's other DNA as well, the bra class. I would encourage people to research it. In sum, just understand that there's some very intelligent people, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz among them, who believe that not only is there evidence of guilt, there's considerable evidence of guilt, and that thousands of people have been convicted on less evidence than this. Right? And just understand the weaknesses to Amanda Knox's behavior following this murder include people like the Postal Police. Also, this idea about the DNA I would encourage on the knife found at Raphael's place, I would encourage people to go to a website. It's called the murder of Again, the murder of They will actually show you the DNA printout on that website. It's clear that the knife has Meredith Kircher's DNA on it. Right? The Amanda Knox people want you to believe that there is major police corruption here. That the people in Italy don't know how to read a DNA test and have an axe to grind with young, sexually active American women. Right? The tale is far-fetched and broad-reaching. Unless, of course, Amanda Knox is guilty. And, of course, is trying to hide her guilt by accusing others of committing the crime, right? By trying to convince postal police not to open the door to Meredith's room, 
right, by being involved in a burglary that, quite frankly, can't be duplicated. I would encourage people to look at the window that the alleged burglar was supposed to have climbed through and just ask yourself if that's even possible. Look at the pattern of the broken glass from the window and ask yourself if it's consistent with the kind of burglary being alleged here. Ask yourself, too, with regard to bloodstains, right? Keep in mind, these women weren't living together for that long, right? Understand, Filomeno Romanelli's blood wasn't found mixed with Meredith Kirchner's blood. Not even in her bedroom. But yet, one of the bloodstains, one of the bloodstains has Amanda Knox's blood mixed with Meredith Kirchner's blood there. Right? Let me also point out, too, it looks like Romanelli's room is ransacked before the glass on the window is broken. I would encourage everyone to go through the evidence and analyze it and then ask yourself if it fits the timeline. Now, I have no doubt that Tom, Dick, Harry, and Jane, right? A bunch of people are gonna comment in this video and say that Alan Dershowitz is crazy, that I'm crazy, that we're misinterpreting the evidence, that we're making up stories, that Amanda Knox was clear with the postal police and that the postal police are mistaken, or that the roommates, Filomeno Romanelli and Mazzetti, are both deluded and that Meredith Kirchner always locked her door and that there was no reason to be concerned even with blood in the hallway and with um, an alleged burglary at the residence, right? I'm sure you're going to hear all of that just as you've heard all of that already in response to people online who've tried to intelligently talk about the evidence in this case. Just understand that even I, a person who believes that Diane Downs may have been falsely convicted, a person who believes that Adnan Syed shouldn't have been convicted, right? Even I believe that Amanda Knox should have been convicted, was rightfully convicted, because she did this crime, in my opinion. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.